Hey, good morning, everyone. It's nice to see you again, uh, at least virtually. Um, and what I imagine you're looking really terrific in in your PJs and uh, wherever you are. Um, we, uh, you know, this week has started uh, for us um, again our transition back to uh, back to campus on uh, June 15th. We've started to open up the campus a little bit more with. Um, with really our supervisors and managers working with offices to make sure that we have appropriate coverage um, as um, as parents, uh, students and others continue to to uh, investigate Snow College for uh, for this fall. Um, let me uh, suggest uh, uh, that we do um, this. We have uh, some guests uh, on our uh, Microsoft Teams this morning that I'd like to introduce and um, and then we have the regular uh, cabinet members that are here to answer questions uh, that you might have relative to uh, academics, to our calendar, to strategic plan, to budget, enrollment, work conditions, um, et cetera. So we'll get to that. So we have uh, Provost Steve Hood uh, with us. We've got uh, Terry Claussen, um, our Associate VP for Enrollment Management, We've got Josh Hales, our uh, director of HR, and then Vice President uh, uh, Carson Howell. Um, but uh, let me uh, just introduce two other guests that we have. Um, the first I'd like to introduce uh, is uh, Dr. Jessica Gilmore, who is the Associate Commissioner for Workforce Development and Industry Engagement. And uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Gilmore. It's nice to have you uh, with us. And uh, we're going to talk. Uh, specifically this morning about a short term uh, training initiative from the governor's office. And um, so we'll look looking forward to hearing more about that. I also want to welcome uh, Stacy McKiff, uh, who um, is, as you know, our department chair for business, but also uh, going to be the interim uh, associate uh, vice president for academics. She's got a specific assignment as it relates to the um, short term training uh, program that we're trying to uh, to develop and, um, and and so she'll be able to uh, give us more details about how we're going to proceed identifying programs um, how we're communicating with industry leaders etc but let me just turn our attention really for a minute uh, to uh, dr gilmore who um, by the way is just a terrific colleague um, she prior to joining the commissioner staff she was the associate provost for Community Outreach and Economic Development at Utah Valley uh, University. Um, she is someone that gets us because uh, she uh, has a long uh, professional association with community college, especially in the state of Washington. And so we're little, really fortunate to have her in our system uh, in Utah, and uh, she is very, very supportive of Snow College's mission. So uh, welcome, um, Associate Commissioner Gilmore. and. Uh, do you want to give us a little more background on uh, on you and, and what are some of the, the, the primary projects uh, you've been tasked with in this role? Sure. So as President Cook shared, I'm originally from Washington State where I spent about 20 years of my career working in community college. Um, I was a faculty member in community college and business information technology before I moved back into sort of the private world and worked in higher ed for Pearson Education and then became a Dean of Business at Walla Walla Community College, which is a small rural community college in southeastern Washington and um, had the opportunity to go visit Capitol Reef and do a little social distancing camping this past weekend. And on our way home, we went ahead and had our lunch picnic on Snow College's campus, which was just lovely. My husband hadn't seen the campus and when we pulled up, he said, wait, this is a community college. <laughs> it's the most gorgeous community college I've ever seen. So we took a little walk around your campus and just got to enjoy your beautiful scenery and um, all of the things that your town has to offer, which was a nice piece to have on our day. But uh, my role at the commissioner's office is a new role. I started in February and um, interim commissioner Wollstone Hume had hired me specifically in anticipation of our two systems, the technical college system and the UCI system joining under one Utah system of higher education and helping our students 
to traverse our two systems more seamlessly and creating pathways for students so that they can choose where they're going, whether it's technical education or you know, straight through a PhD program. All of those routes are viable. And the great thing about Snow College is that you guys get the best of both worlds. Not only do you have the opportunity to teach technical education program, you know, short industry focused, direct to work type programs, but you get to build those in a stackable way, ensuring that students have meaningful milestones and credentials along the way, but never have what I call an educational cul-de-sac where they start down one path and then, you know, in order to go on to the next degree, they have to turn around and go back and start at the beginning of another. So Snow College is perfectly positioned to really be the best of both worlds in our state. And I'm super excited to work with all of you on creating those pathways together. Thanks, Dr. Dr. Gilmore. Well, um, why don't you describe to uh, us uh, this recent initiative by Governor Herbert to take some of the CARES Act money and set that aside for one time grants to institutions of higher education to help kind of uh, prompt and ignite um, the economy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we want to just outline sort of the, 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 the kind of 30,000 foot view of what the intent there Sure. So as you all know, in response to the pandemic, the federal government allocated lots of millions of dollars to states individually. So our state in the first rollout of that funding did things like paid for contact tracing and PPE and PPP for our small businesses to make sure folks could stay employed. And that's all been happening as we've you know progressed through this unique time in our history, but there's some additional money left from those original CARES dollars that are allocated out to the state and we're still in negotiations uh, working through the legislative process to figure out the best way to deploy those, but it's very clear that there's an interest in ensuring that there are some block grants available for our higher ed institutions, both on the technical education side and on our degree granting side to shape and create short term focused programming that could be targeted for our unemployed, our underemployed and our vulnerable employed workers to ensure that they could skill up during this time of uncertainty. Maybe they're unemployed but still attached to an employer, so they're they're ready to go back to new to their employer as soon as business picks up, but they've got a little free time that they could actually skill up in an area that would make them more valuable to their employer or they're an employee who is working in somewhat of a vulnerable type of an employment situation. Maybe they work in food service. And as we see the incidence of virus load pick up, we might see a little bit of contraction in our ability to be out and about in our communities and they're vulnerable to a future layoff. So while they're working, continuing to skill up and be either more valuable to their current employer or be able to pivot and shift to a new employment area would be valuable to them and our economy, right? As we ensure that people are employed, we ensure that our economy stays robust. And we know, particularly based on the results and what's happened during this pandemic, those employees that have at least a post high school credential have stayed employed longer and in better wage jobs through this time of uncertainty. So we want to make sure that more and more of our Utahns have access to those credentials and that doesn't have to be a four year degree. It can certainly be a six week training program in order to build up their skill set and then stack that into further education once they're back in the uh, employed arena. Now, the sort of kicker for us in higher ed is that this is all federal CARES dollars and the feds were very clear that the money has to be expended by December 31st. And for those of us in higher education, we sort of think oh, that's only six months away. <laughs> It's a really short runway for us to ramp up, create programming, enroll students, get them you know, in, through, and completed in a program. But we're confident that with small pivots to existing programming that you have, we can really make that a successful way for students, uh, potential students to get some meaningful credentials in the short term. Now, the nice piece about that December 31st deadline is that the money has to be expended 
but the training doesn't have to be completed. So we have a little bit of wiggle room on that window to be able to continue training students, even if they've paid that tuition with those care dollars waivers by the end of the year. So that's sort of the big picture, what we're hoping for. Again, we're still negotiating with legislature and working on all of the fine details of that. But as an institution, if you can really think about the local needs that your employers might have had prior to the pandemic, our economists are telling us that post pandemic, those employment needs aren't going to shift very much. This isn't a disruptive economic um, issue that's happening. It's really just a stop and then a restart. So where we saw 2.5% unemployment prior to the pandemic, those areas that were struggling to find employees or looking to, to build up their workforce are gonna be the same areas that we can train into for the future. Terrific, those that have just joined us, I want to um, uh, introduce uh, Dr. Jessica Gilmore, who's the Associate, uh, Associate Commissioner for Workforce Development and Industry Engagement who is just uh, outlining for us uh, an initiative by the state to provide uh, resources to, to campuses like ours to develop programs that are short term in nature, but very industry focused. Um, so um, uh, Dr. Gilmore, can you tell us a little bit more about um, how the money is intended? Uh, what uh, what are, you know, lar a large part of it is actually for the students themselves, right? So to, to offset right the costs that they might might have but, but what what is the intended uh, use of these uh, of this money which is not insignificant i think they've the state has set aside um i've heard as high as 50 million dollars and uh, but, but what uh, what's the money supposed to be used for in addition to just programming Sure. So obviously the, the legislature and our, our government peers are really interested in ensuring that students can pay for classes, right? If you're unemployed or underemployed, paying tuition is the last thing that you have disposable income to do. So they're looking to target the majority of the funds from the CARES funding towards tuition waivers or scholarships. And um, be able to offset that cost for students. But they recognize that there are some other costs that come along with going to school. Potentially, as we have pivoted and put up the large majority of our programs fully online, the ability for a student to access online program requires a computer. And if they don't have that, that can become part of the supplies needed to successfully complete a course. So they're open to even paying for books and supplies and related costs to enable students to be able to access that programming. Now, we all work in higher ed. We know that education doesn't just happen because we pay our faculty to teach the class. There's a lot of other expenses that go into creating programming and supporting really successful programming for students. So the um, folks who are overseeing how to distribute these funds have recognized that a portion of that funding could go towards paying for administrative costs, whether that's increasing your adjunct faculty in order to increase the capacity of a program that's already at its limit, or um, whether that's it's some administrative cost or even outreach cost to ensure that if you have students who are going fully online, we know that personal contact with someone at the institution is really critical. So being able to beef up some of that outreach and connectivity with students could be potential. We're really working to ensure that the application process is as streamlined as possible. We don't want to overburden our institutions with having to write novels in order to have access to these block grants, but rather that you propose the types of program that you're going to do, the types of resources that students will need to access those programs, and then the resources the institution will need to successfully ramp those programs up. There will be some reporting requirements, obviously, if it's a legislatively uh, appropriated funding, whether it's federal legislation or state legislation, they're always going to want us to report back on our successes. But again, we're working to keep that reporting as streamlined as possible because we have a lot on our plates right now. We just want to make sure that we get the students in the door, get them the really robust training that they need and help them get back out into the workforce. Yeah. Well, um, we've got a lot to uh, to consider and, um, you know, given given the budget situation uh, this year and, and by the mm -hmm. way, 
it looks like the executive appropriations committee, which will make, make will be making the final deter determination on the budget reductions uh, for state entities, including Snow College. That happens later today, I think, right, Carson? So we don't know exactly what the budget cut will be. What we do know is though there will be no new money, uh, right, for um, for higher education, and the budget cut will be placed on uh, really last year's uh, budget. So that said, this is really the only new money uh, really that higher education is going to see this year. And the good news is, is that this is right in our bailiwick. This is right in our wheelhouse as to what we should be doing anyway. So the money that we're at, actually, we we're going to get about $600,000 of ongoing resources to be able to kick off our technical education uh, dimension uh, for Snow College. Uh, that is not going to happen this year, but this is a way in which we can get a kickstart and get uh, really this programming up and going. Um, and then we can go back to the legislature next year for, for ongoing, you know, uh, funds uh, if these programs, you know, are, um, are uh, sustainable and, and viable. So getting uh, ourselves organized was part of the, the challenge, right, uh, in terms of being able to step up to this relatively um, kind of spontaneous decision for the, gov the governor to put resources this way. And so we really uh, had to think about how we could move quickly, um, how we could organize ourselves, how we could identify programs that we did, ex that currently exist in our inventory, but also maybe identifying programs that we needed to create. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I'm very happy that uh, Stacey McKiff has agreed to lead this effort uh, I think she has demonstrated incredible competence and skill. She helped co-chair the strategic planning process, but really has just been, I think, an administrative uh, superstar um, in business and, and in other uh, aspects of her career here. So um, I, I'd like to, to bring Stacy in on this because we essentially like plopped this down on her desk and said, OK, uh, make something of this. And uh, so do you want to little talk a little bit about um, how we plan to go about this? Uh, some of the timelines, the fairly short timelines that we have to respond to um, in order to get these uh, proposals in and for approvals. There will be, if, if there are any new programs, we will have to have a Board of Trustees approval. Our next Board of Trustees meeting is on the 26th of, of June. So we're working hard to see if, the, you know, if there are new programmings, we will need to get their uh, sort of their approval. But we have a lot again in the toolbox already. It's just a matter of you know being able to to shape it uh, into a more short-term format that wouldn't need uh, that kind of approval. But Stacy, welcome. Good morning. And uh, so, talk to us a little bit about how you see this and and uh, how you see Snow College moving forward uh, with this particular challenge. Good morning, everyone. Great to be with you. It's been an exciting project to work on with a great group of people. President has pulled together some, some people to come and have this discussion, including representatives from the SBDC, Tim and Christine Craig. We have Darren Owens from our Economic Development Group, as well as people from Academic Affairs and Advising, and we have Terry, we have Dr. Hood, Melanie, Carson. There are a lot of us involved in this process right now. And so the whole point is to figure out the needs in our local area, and how we can fulfill those needs. So we're working right now on accepting proposals. And if you're faculty or staff, you received an email from me outlining what we need to do and inviting you to submit your innovative, exciting proposals that we can execute by August. The proposals are due on June 23rd. That's on Tuesday at 5 p.m. I've sent out a link to our website that gives some more information. We have some frequently asked questions at the bottom of that website, and uh, you can get more information there. But basically, we're looking for those proposals from faculty or staff by June 23rd. The trustees will approve a group of proposals to move forward to Yushi, to Dr. Gilmore's group. And then we hope the turnaround time is pretty quick on the approval at the state level because then we're going to immediately be executing the implementation and the development of these courses. 
And so I just want to say too that we've been reaching out to a lot of our partners in the community to find out what you know what are the needs. We also, I forgot to mention Mike Medley, our CTE director, he's recently executed a comprehensive report on CTE in the area and some of the feedback we've gotten from companies, parents, students, etc. And so we have some good ideas about the needs in the area. And I've, I've listed some of those in the emails I've sent out and just hoping that if you have expertise in those areas or you think you can ramp up the program by August 24th, we really want you to, to submit that proposal. We also don't want the proposal to be a really time consuming. I'm really happy with what Dr. Gilmore just said about, you know, it doesn't have to be an accreditation report level proposal. We just want the proposal, what, what you think it's going to cost, the benefits you think it'll have, how many people can be impacted, and that's what we're really going for here. So it's a really exciting time. So I actually submitted a proposal last night um, just to see how the process would go. Um, I, 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 it probably needs a, a little work, but I wanted to go through the process to see how much work. So thank you for streamlining, uh, streamlining that, uh, Stacy. And it really is um, uh, doesn't take a whole lot of time to make this, uh, you know. But we need to make sure that um, that um, we have a clear idea. And this is where I'm hoping that Dr. Gilmore can help us out. Is that where what what kind of characteristics of these uh, programs will get priority? Um, and so, do you want to sort of talk about um, about when when your group looks at this, what will really be the the kind of rubric that you will be looking at these uh, proposals with? Oop, looks like you're on uh, mute. There we go. There we go. All there right. One time every meeting, right? <laughs> um, so I think a lot of the prioritization of projects will depend on feedback that we get from the legislature and from the governor's office of management and budgets. But in the conversations that I've been having with those groups up to this point, they're very interested in um, programs that can allow students to stay employed if possible while they're gaining credentials because we don't want to take students out of the workforce that are in the workforce in order to go to school as a substitute, right? We want to keep them in the workforce. So building, um, they're very interested in building any apprenticeship programs or opportunities there, but recognizing that employers are struggling to have employees at work due to the COVID uh, issues and social distancing. So, you know, balancing those two pieces out. So in lieu of a traditional apprenticeship, any program that is connected directly to a employer or an industry sector and has a clear path for the student from completion of the curriculum with the, the college and then direct entry into employment is going to be the, the type of program that's prioritized. So for example, there um, in the Lehigh area, obviously we have tons of high tech businesses so Mountain Land Technical College is looking at ways that they can ramp up short term trainings that will allow uh, students to get certifications that are necessary to enter directly into those high tech fields. The same would be true out in the Snow College region as well. You have employers who have those types of needs. When I visited a Snow College the last time prior to my picnic this weekend, um, we talked about needs in your area around bookkeeping. There are uh, lots of small businesses, need for bookkeeping, payroll, and other types of, types of elements that would keep small businesses afloat. So having some short-term training in QuickBooks, in bookkeeping type elements, in payroll, accounts, re accounts receivable, accounts payable, would be great short-term skills that are um, tied directly to a workforce need and asked for in job postings. So that type of curriculum is going to be something that is really attractive. Then, of course, the last element that I think our legislator, the legislatures have talked about just abundantly every time they talk about higher ed is stackable, right? Um, if we're not creating a pathway for a student to complete the short term training with us right now between your August 24th start date and the end of December or if their training goes into the early part of the spring, and then have a pathway for them to continue 
we're making a mistake. So we want to make sure that students understand and take advantage of this time that we have their captured attention. If they're brand new students to us and have never been part of our higher ed family, make sure that we're using this instructional time to add in the what's next for you. Make sure that we're adding in the how are you going to pay for it when this uh, COVID CARES dollars goes away. If you want to continue your education, we want to make sure that we're connecting you to the right resources on our campus to ensure that you're getting your FAFSA filled out, that you are accessing scholarship applications so that you can continue on with your education. So it's that employer attached, work-based learning opportunities wherever possible, direct link to some sort of employer, individual employer or employment sector, and then that stackable credential so that they can start here, get the meaningful milestone, and then move further in their education process. Would you also say that that uh, that uh, proposals would be um, kind of entertained or even prioritized if there are partnerships involved, not just with industry, but let's say our school districts are yes. um, say even with partnered with our technical colleges uh, around yeah. the, the state, uh, we've been playing with some ideas that uh, that we have some interesting innovative curriculum, right? Uh, for example, composites, and not everybody has a composites program even in these technical colleges because they're lacking maybe equipment. So if we could provide the didactic training, right, for a composite, you know, a manufacturing element, um, you know, and then we essentially could ask for equipment where people then could be taking the online Snow College composites but then go into Dixie ATC or something to complete the lab component. Is that something that, uh, or is that gonna be, is that too involved, too, uh, <laughs> is that overcomplicating what? I, I think if you all feel confident that you can spin something up and deploy it in enough time to get students and engaged with the curriculum and completed with some sort of certificate before our time runs out, we're going to entertain it, right? And I am the queen of supporting statewide articulation agreements. It is my dream to have all of our technical colleges aligned with several types of certifications because our students are becoming more and more mobile, right? They may start up in Logan, but end up at Snow College or end up in St. George. They're moving around where the employment is. And the more we can articulate between and intermix what we're offering so that students who start up in Logan don't and move to Ephraim don't hit that dead end and have to turn around and start over, the better off we are and the better we're serving our communities. And when we think about our communities as a statewide community rather than just our own local community, we have a broader viewpoint. So those partnerships are huge in my mind. The more we can share curriculum, we. We shouldn't all have to reinvent the wheel. I mean, my favorite program that I like to use an example is underwater basket weaving, right? That underwater basket weaving curriculum isn't different no matter where you teach it. So we might as well just create that curriculum once and share it amongst our institutions and offer that underwater basket weaving certificate across the state. I recognize it's it's an industry that's a little underwater right now, but <laughs> it'll, it'll come back, I'm sure. Well, done. well played there, Dr. Gill. <laughs> Hey, yeah, uh, Stacy actually sent out the email uh, this morning, right, Stacy? Did that go out to the general um, faculty and staff? And do you want to sort of walk them through uh, what that email, the intent of that email? Right. So we sent it out to faculty on Friday last week and sent it out to staff this morning. And so if you didn't get an email today or on Friday, then feel free to email me and I'll send the information out to you. So what the content of the email contained basically is an explanation of the funding and then and then some ideas of how your proposal could take shape along with the with the deadlines. And so we we also have on the website and you'll see the website in your in your links on the email I sent out. We also have some DWS data that you can look at to make sure that whatever you're proposing actually has job availability or demand. So we have a, a few links from DWS and then a national link as well. It's been exciting to have the, the BAT leadership with on Barnhurst Sardine uh, trying to trying to encourage people who are totally ready and and capable to deliver some of these programs too. 
But we, we are really interested in proposals from all corners of campus, as long as they fit these criteria that Dr. Gilmore has been talking about. Also, someone asked a question, I think, about the SBDC and their involvement. And for those of you who don't know, SBDC Small Business Development Center. And the Small Business Development Center is run by Tim Chamberlain, Craig Blake, and Christine Hanks. And, and their job all the time is to provide short-term training for, for employers uh, and employees getting their employees up to speed, or even people who are looking for a job but just need that extra skill. So we're definitely gonna be partnering with the SBDC and looking at even some STIT training, that's short-term intensive training that continues even after this funding has expired in December. So all of these partnerships and, and all of these relationships, you know, ev everything's on the table. Let's come together and be really innovative and come up with some great ideas. I think it's a really important point to underscore the um, the Department of Workforce Services data that gives us a pretty a pretty good picture of the types of of uh, job advertisements that are out in the central region of Utah at any given time. So, um, Stacey, how do we plan on on um, and sort of uh, liaising with DWS? Because it seems to me that when we work with caseworkers for DWS. This will be important because as they work with unemployed individuals, that they're fully aware of what um, of what Snow College will be offering. So, how do we plan about that, go about that so that DWS is fully aware, so that they can start you know channeling students to to programs that are that are available uh, and accessible locally. Well, this I think I'm correct in saying this, but Yushi is going to be helping with the marketing of, of these programs, but we know that we're going to have to come up with our own micro marketing activities as well. And DWS is a huge part of that, as well as the private employment agencies, as well as the school districts, the CTE directors, advisory committees, advisory boards. So we have a plan to engage all of those people when we know which programs we're going to be able to deliver, it'll be very important to get the word out because as we've been talking in our meetings, the worst outcome is we come up with a really great program and nobody takes advantage of it. And so we think it's very important to get the word out with the help of the state, but then we, we will need to be responsible for that marketing on our own too. I would think Dr. Gilmore understands this, this part that uh, especially when it comes to rural institutions like ours, we can have terrific ideas, terrific programming, um, great labs, um, great experience. It's but connecting the student demand to these programs is is not easy. It's, it's the Achilles heel um, for these programs, and and so we've got to be smarter than uh, than folks that might be in an urban or metro area where you know, where there's a larger uh, concentration of people. So um, how would you uh, describe the marketing effort, say, from the state or from the system? Um, and then what would you advise of how we can actually, we're actually considering a call center <laughs> so that we actually, you know, we're going to have folks calling um, uh, individuals because we think unless we get right down to grassroots, connecting those dots for, for folks, we worry that there's going to be a lot of effort right for very little student return which which we do not want to have so what would your counsel be on that front yeah i 100 percent agree with you that a call center is a fabulous idea um the state what we're asking for in a direction around these dollars is we're asking that a portion of the dollars be designated for a statewide marketing campaign meaning that you should work with our partners to ensure that we have consistent branding because the grant dollars would be available to all 16 of our post-secondary institutions, we don't want 16 different messages about what this is. We want one global message and we'll, we'll work to create that branding and the collateral and then provide it to each of the institutions so that you can push it out to your local constituencies because that local voice is really what's going to resonate with your student populations and your employers, right? Um, you know who your local Chamber of Commerce reps are, your SBDC folks, your um, different uh, 
social groups that are available to your local needs. So we will provide that branding message, all of the collateral that goes with that, and then allow each institution to customize those and push that out locally. I agree with you in a larger metropolitan area, if you spin up a program that has 30 seats in it, just by population density, it's a lot easier for those uh, um, urban places to find 30 students to fill those seats. In a rural market, you have a smaller population and fewer folks to draw from who are available to say, hey, I have time to either go attend this in person or I have time in addition to all of my other responsibilities and obligations to take this online course. So real, will really be incumbent upon you all in brainstorming who are the different audiences and how are we going to speak to them, whether that's you know high school graduates who just completed in spring here and getting connected with those high school students. It could be parents of those high school students who don't have a credential that um, forces them to be unemployed or underemployed currently. It could be employers who have laid off their staff and have direct connection to those laid off workers and are willing to reach out to them and encourage those workers to get a credential while they're laid off. It could be um, just your different organizations in your community and getting those voices out. We want to make sure that all of those communications are culturally relevant to the diversity of our communities so that we're speaking into the language that they're going to hear. But we recognize that there's really multiple audiences here, so we're um, anxious to get that marketing so that it can speak to the diversity of those audiences and make sure that you guys have all the tools that you need to then push that out. But a call center, particularly for those some college no degree students, I would start looking back into your um, your enrollments, you know, five, six, seven years back. Who didn't complete one of those certifications and could get back in and in a short amount of time complete some post-secondary credential? We know that's going to make a difference in their longevity and their earning potential into the future. So if we can connect them back in and then use that time when we have them and use that course, not only deliver the course content, but to deliver that marketing message to them that higher ed is really going to make a difference in their lives long term and we want to keep them connected to us. Then get them graduated and keep them connected as alumni, right? It's that whole circle of life. We want to outfit them in orange forever, right, President <laughs> Cook? That's the spirit. That's the spirit. <laughs> and let me just remind those that are, uh, have joined us that we have Dr. Jessica Gilmore as a guest this morning, uh, the Associate Commissioner for Workforce Development and Industry Engagement. Um, we also, though, want to, uh, to let uh, the audience know that we have um, uh, our other cabinet members um, that are on, uh, on the line. And so as we um, as we uh, as you have questions, um, not just related to the topic at hand, which is the this uh, strategic short term training initiative from the state uh, that we're uh, we're trying to organize um, around. Uh, I'm sure there are lots of other questions that you might have about uh, about the campus. So uh, please uh, feel free to make sure you're taking advantage of the chat or not the chat, but the actual Q and A uh, feature on uh, this uh, this Microsoft Teams. Um, and so I just want to make sure that people know that we have uh, Dr. Steve Hood, uh, Terry Claussen, uh, Josh Hales, uh, Carson Howell uh, with us, as well as Stacy McKiff. So uh, please uh, start uh, those questions that might relate re that you might be uh, um, um, that might be on top of mind. Uh, please uh, go ahead and, and, and start those and we can start another uh, sort of topic chain. While you're thinking about questions, though, um, I want to remind folks that uh, if that 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 if you're hesitant to um, offer, let's say uh, a, a proposal because it may uh, it may impact your ability to say teach it or something, just know that the the, the where we can build in resources either for compensation, right, or to find other available and willing um, folks in the community or otherwise that could deliver it. So um, please provide uh, uh, the, the ideas and, and even if it doesn't, um, uh, even if you can't sort of individually participate, yeah, we may, we may uh, be able to find uh, other qualified folks uh, that would be willing uh, to, uh, to do this. Um, 
so so any uh, while we have uh, while we're kind of waiting for other questions that might relate to uh, enrollment or um, uh, about uh, the budget situation or any of these things um, uh, Stacy do you have any questions that you might uh, have for for Jessica um, this morning as we sort of embark on our uh, adventure here one question I have is related to high school students. Does can any of this money go to fund the training of high school students, for example? So if it's um, obviously concurrent enrollment courses, students are paying that that lower tuition. And you know, if that's an an area that you guys want to propose, I we haven't discussed it at the legislative level or at the GOMB level, but it certainly, you know those students will be entering the workforce eventually, so that's going to be a good thing for us. And then, of course, since you all offer the technical education, I'm assuming that high school students at times are attending your technical programs as well, and that's tuition free, but they may need some support with supplies because their families are unemployed or underemployed. So that would be another area that I would certainly add to the application. There's there's no reason why that wouldn't be, um, but obviously, the priority for the legislature and for the governor's office of management and budget is reinvigorating our economy as quickly as possible so that'll be a priority area but i would say don't not offer an idea because we never know when that idea is going to be the best idea of them all and i would put that out to your entire community if you're thinking of a program as president cook has said you know that application process you don't uh, you know, prejudge your own idea and take your idea out of consideration before you've submitted it because we can always add to that idea or pivot it slightly and it could be the most amazing program. So please put forward all of those ideas. This is a great opportunity to pilot new things and see what's going to work in your community and at your institution. And if we can pilot it with with dollars from the federal government, why not? Yeah. Stacey, you may see a, a question on the, the board there. Uh, the question is, is there a minimum credit level or classroom hour requirement for uh, the course to be considered? And I, I don't think that, that, that there is, but you want to talk about it because it could be everything from, you know, just a few hours, right? Like QuickBooks, for example, maybe just a few hours of training versus, um, you know, something that may be a little longer term, a full semester. Uh, so, so do you want to talk about the whole kind of range of, of of uh, offerings we could consider? Absolutely, and we're jumping into kind of an area we haven't we haven't explored very well yet, including badging and micro-credentialing. And what we're hearing from employers and from DWS and others is that the soft skills really need to be developed. So it's not just, can you do this hard skill, but can you work with other people people you show up for work on time, those kinds of things too. And so uh, I guess the answer to the question is no, there's no real minimum. If it takes you six hours to get through this training where we can credential you or micro-credential you in excellent communication skills, then great. Uh, let's, let's go from there and then we'll stack it with something else as we go along. Uh, Dr. Gilmer, can I just ask you about, about equipment? Mm -hmm. You know, what if we what if we want to buy a bunch of drones to do some ag business training or some construction management training with drones or other big equipment? Is that legitimate in the request? Yeah, I think everything is open to requesting and then it will be a matter of how much money is allocated and how many programs can we support across the 16 institutions. But when you think about if the majority of the dollars, you know, let's say 80 to 90% is designated for tuition waivers or scholarships, that's a lot of tuition waivers and scholarships when you're talking millions of dollars, right? So there's a lot of programming we can support there. Um, we're waiting on GOMB to sort of give us the parameters on what percentage they'll designate for equipment or administrative costs. But again, I wouldn't not put forward an idea because if it's a great idea, I'm going to champion it and go to bat for it. If it's something that we can show a need for in our workforce and show that it's a high demand, high wage type of a field, and the only thing preventing us from putting on this program is, you know, $50,000 in equipment, 
that's a drop in the bucket when we're talking about making a difference in students' lives and spinning up programs that could be long-term type programs. So the original um, conversation around the length of programming, they had really talked about six weeks to 30 weeks, but I, I go back to President Cockett in the legislative session this last year, really talking about what she coined as dynamic credentialing. We love to think about stackable and our students going in a linear process. They finish high school, they transition to college, they may get a one year certificate, a two year degree, a four year degree, a graduate degree, and it's this linear layout. It's not that way, particularly in a downturn in the economy. Students need to grab onto these credentials as they can, and it's a more dynamic process. So getting those micro credentials and having those add up through PLA to a course that allows them to progress on towards a certificate or a degree is a great way to use this funding and really build up the offerings that your college has. Terrific. Well, listen, if we don't mind, um, we, we can just kind of shift gears and please stay with us, uh, Dr. Gilmore. And, and, and if you do need to leave, let us know. But uh, we may have some other questions as we kind of move along here. We, we usually go about an hour to hour 15. So so um, but we'll stay on as long as there are questions. Um, I, I want to take a minute, though, and really thank uh, some of our employees who uh, spent time making these uh, really terrific masks. Uh, Donna Burke, uh, Denise Tippett, uh, Carol Green. Uh, we have one for each of our uh, employees, and uh, I think we're actually working for a lot of distribution for students as well. So Donna, Denise, Carol, you are terrific. Thank you so much. And and those that uh, don't have one, uh, go. I think I think uh, Josh, are they in um, are they in in the HR office? They can they can pick up. Yeah, that's right. Uh, we have a whole bunch in HR and then uh, for those employees in Richfield, uh, they can go pick them up from uh, Stacey or Marie. They're in the, in the administration building. All right. Well, terrific. I also want to announce uh, some of our employees of uh, staff employees of the semester. Uh, our very own Chase Mitchell, who's in this room. Well, well done, Chase. Uh, Danae uh, Hecko and Annette Taylor. Uh, thank you so much for all you do. This is uh, these are recognitions that um, are facilitated by the staff association and uh, all three of those um, folks are well well deserving of that recognition so thank you um, to everybody uh, one of the questions that uh, that is uh, that has uh, um, arised this morning really is about again what does what do classes look like um, when students come back in in august and so if i can maybe pull in uh, provost hood on this particular question um, what one uh, concerns really is what will classes look like? Um, and uh, this is a, a, a subject we are continually visiting and revisiting about the safety right of our our staff, faculty and students. Um, so what would you uh, say to uh, um, us about at this point the plan um, looks like what with these uh, with with the planning of face to face classes? but uh, appropriate safety protocols such as distancing and uh, and, and masks. Um, what would how would you describe um, what life will look like for us uh, in August? So we are going to be teaching face to face. That's what our plan is. Um, we are going to ask students that to wear masks and um, faculty members can request that students who are not wearing masks to sit in the back of the classroom. <laughs> Uh, because we we want to make sure that we are uh, safely distancing people as much as possible. Um, the um, we are going to be teaching uh, in face to face, but there may be cases where a student becomes ill and we don't want them to come to class. And so what we will then do is we're hoping that some faculty can record uh, their lectures by their computer as they're going or by camera. It has been pointed out that we have very few cameras actually in a lot of the classrooms and so we're trying to price those right now even if we can get them however it may be impossible to get them installed in time to uh to be able to to do this but we're doing our best so what we're going to try to do is uh in, in the event that a student becomes ill we hope that you'll be able to record the session somehow uh, to where that person can either listen in synchronously 
or it will be recorded and then can be uh, put in a zip file sent to them so that they can listen to it asynchronously. It does create a burden. We do not expect faculty to have to record a lecture twice where they would deliver uh, something to a class face to face and then turn around and do that um, to a, a student. We're not we're not expecting that, but it could be that you have to have a plan in shape. What Provost Jen Jenkins was doing yesterday when she sent out that email was try to get faculty to think of options. If I have a student who's sick or I have some students who are sick, how can I best get the message to them? How can I best get the class distributed to them in a way that will help them to be able to keep up uh, in the course and be able to be successful? Um, and then also what she's looking at is, is in the event that we have to go back to um, distance education, what, how am I going to make that trans that that uh, transition as seamless as possible? And so, um, while some institutions are uh, at this point going to close at Thanksgiving and end the semester, or they're going online after Thanksgiving, we have not just opted to do that. It could be necessary, though, for us at any point to be able to to be able to be quick on our feet, nimble, and be able to make that transition. So we just want to make sure that faculty members are doing the best we can. There are lots of options uh, this summer. We have uh, we have uh, workshops on online courses. We have workshops on, uh, you can still get help from Chase Mitchell down in uh, Teaching and Technology Center for how to do better do uh, um, synchronous and asynchronous uh, learning so there's a lot of different things that are being offered with with stipends to be able to help faculty be able to make this transition so that we're giving the best product that we we can we want to learn what we did well and share those results with everybody from spring semester and we want to be able to know share the challenges that we had and be able to get help from one another to make sure that we're delivering the best uh, learning product possible you know, you mentioned uh, the, uh, uh, the the uh, an interesting conversation that we ought to have and was actually suggested by one of the audiences about this notion. Uh, the University of Utah, by the way, has been very public about um, as students leave their campus at Thanksgiving that the students will not come back and they'll com complete the semester online. Um, the, the fear is, is that when students kind of leave Thanksgiving, they're just going to come back and and make uh, make uh, you know create greater risk. I think Utah State is considering uh, that option. SUU, I believe, is is actually trying to do their scheduling where uh, finals will be over and completed by Thanksgiving. Uh, the other institutions like Dixie, uh, Weber State, uh, Utah Valley have yet to make a decision about that. I would be very interested in this group, um, uh, our audience, to to talk to us about this. Um, what we do know. Uh, is that we want to be safe. We don't want to um, to put people at risk, but we do know that that students want to be face to face. And so we're trying to balance this out of what is the what is the balance between uh, safety, but also being able to support students academically. And uh, there is an argument to be made that students need the kind of support, the most support really uh, right around the end of the semester. So we've not made a decision. So we're actually uh, interested in your feedback as to what you recommend that we might do on that that particular uh, question. Um, that there is a, was, was some um, another question again about going back to how do we make sure that that faculty don't have to do it twice uh, that uh, that the that the equipment that we have um, um, will will uh, kind of minimize uh, that kind of concern. Uh, do you want to, Provost Hood, maybe just uh, kind of circle back on that point? Right. So again, we're we're trying to purchase cameras for classrooms so that we would not have to teach these classes twice. In the event that those cameras do not come, you're not expected to teach them twice. But what you do need to have in place is you need to have a plan to be able to reach students whose online assignments through um, uh, any type of guided learning that you can give them from a distance standpoint. If you want to take your laptop to the classroom, record 
uh, the discussions that go on there and then send them that file from your classes, you can do that. Um, the expectation is, is that you're not going to be teaching it twice, but it is going to require some effort to try to help students who may be ill and are unable to come. Um, so that's what we're trying to get you to, to, to think about is, you know, how, what would be the best method that I could use to be able to get this information to ensure continuity and to make sure students have a chance to be successful in my class and to meet uh, the challenges that, that are given them, given their health circumstances, but also know that the class has to meet certain expectations and standards. So we don't want you to teach twice. Uh, we're trying to help out with additional cameras, but you need to be thinking about, OK, this portion could be done online with this assignment. OK, this portion of the class, you know, you're going to have this paper due and this test due, but I'm going to allow you to take a test this way as an alternate assignment, or I'm going to have you do this reading and then uh, do an additional assignment to make up for the class uh, uh, lecture that you missed or the class discussion that was missed. Thank you for your we've got a lot of participation, especially on the on the Thanksgiving question. Um, we've got uh, statements that are saying, hey, listen, let's stay as normal as we can uh, with the face to face. Um, uh, we have some saying whatever you do, let's make the decision sooner than later. Um, I, I, I hear you uh, on that. Uh, there is actually uh, one saying, hey, let's be done before Christmas because the student's attention is never as good after Thanksgiving anyway. Uh, so the, the way that uh, that I think the Utah State and uh, Utah University of Utah model and SUU model is, is that they would they would not have a fall break. They would essentially have courses uh, working all through fall uh, for fall break. So that would pick up a, a week um, as well. And, and these are on the table. You know, we can continue to, to consider uh, to consider this. Um, um, let me uh, just look at some of the other questions here as uh, one of the questions that we have is really relative to budget. And, uh, you know, are people, should people be concerned about layoffs? And and uh, I'm really uh, very, very confident that we have found a way as a president's cabinet to identify the cuts that we're likely to have. We've made a, we've identified a range of anywhere from a 2% uh, up to a 10%. Um, every indication is, is that it'll be a, a less than a 10% cut. And with that, we've been able to find ways in which we can protect people. Remember the three P's that have guided us in terms of the principles that we're essentially protecting. We're essentially preserving our mission. We're protecting our people and we're pr promoting avenues of where we can generate a revenue. Um, and especially as it relates to uh, enrollment. So um, I, uh, we will know more this afternoon about the level of those cuts, but if it's anything um, under about six or seven percent, we've been able to find it. We'll present uh, without without laying off anybody. Um, so uh, we, we will. The next time that we meet in this forum, will primarily be dedicated to the question of budget. We do want to make sure that we're um, some of the uh, where we're the budget plan. That we make sure that our, our our budget committee has had a chance to look at that. Uh, some of the other sort of the faculty and the faculty uh, senate, the uh, staff association will have a chance to 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 shape it uh, before we go public. But um, but I think for now, um, I think we're in better shape than most places. It doesn't mean it's not going to be without pain. Uh, that uh, that is clear. Uh, we are going to have to sacrifice and tighten up. But um, but we think that we're going to be able to protect people's uh, financial uh, affairs here. So that's that's uh, very good news. Uh, anything else on that, uh, Carson, uh, that you may want to mention? There's not a lot to say because we just don't know where the, the state's going to come down on it. Yeah, that's correct, President. Um, as as you mentioned earlier, the Executive Appropriations Committee or that legislative committee talking about budget, they will be meeting later today. And, and then the special session will happen on Thursday and Friday this week. And so we'll really get some direction on what we need to do. And then um, they've asked that, that we present the plan to them of what, those, what our budget cut scenario is going to look like um, once we get the final numbers on that. And we'll have to have that presented back to the legislature uh, by, by about July. And so we'll need to act quickly on this. And, and as you mentioned, get those other groups involved, but but uh, we have 
got things uh, a rough framework sketched out. So. Listen, uh, thank you. Back to uh, the, the question on Thanksgiving. Um, this one uh, was said just an opinion. Uh, keep things face to face after Thanksgiving. I've heard students say, including my own uh, son, that if classes aren't face to face, they'll opt to not to attend school at all. Announcing that a face to face will end after Thanksgiving and going online um, will deter students coming in um, uh, in the fall. I think that's a, a legitimate perspective that we need to consider. Uh, one person said, listen, we're happy to start early, uh, skip fall break and end by Thanksgiving uh, if this improves our chances of staying face to face. Also suggest starting spring semester later to avoid the middle of uh, cold and flu season. It's a very, very good thought. Uh, that is a worry um, that it's not just about COVID resurgence uh, in the, the cooler months, but uh, we're going to be dealing again with regular, uh, I think the regular flu, uh, flu season. Um, uh, one of the, the, the questions that, um, well, I, I actually serve on a statewide COVID task force that represents higher education. And um, so we're working through issues related to testing, uh, temperature taking, um, uh, contact tracing, all of these factors that, uh, that we need to consider. But what I'm hearing absolutely from everybody, especially those uh, that are um, uh, virologists and others that 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 are studying this this uh, that really there is the, some of the very basics of what we've been saying all along um, matter that in terms of being able to stem a resurgence of this of this uh, COVID nineteen one is mask wearing uh, two is washing your hands and uh, and sanit uh, uh, sanitizing gels and distancing. So one thing that uh, we're kind of working through our own sort of COVID uh, emergency response team here is really uh, considering making some absolute requirements such as requiring masks if you're going to come into a classroom, right? If you're not, if you don't have a mask coming into the classroom, then um, then you may be excused or having uh, a mask, especially in high density areas uh, like, um, you know, like uh, like 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 our labs, uh, making sure we have plenty of dispensers for for hand sanitizers, and then making sure that we're we're maintaining um, a, a safe distance. So the mask wearing is really really important. So uh, again, it gets yours today. Um, and what's great about this is that uh, it hangs like this, and then when you're ready, it just pops on like that. So again, Donna and. <laughs> Denise, everybody, thank you for that. Um, there's uh, there are some questions uh, related to um, uh, say the recycling center, uh, Carson. Uh, where where are we on the recycling center? Uh, it is a complicated one because of lots of factors, including uh, the expense of of of, um, of of transporting the material. Well, can you give uh, the campus an update on recycling? Yeah, so President, as you mentioned, there there is a cost for it right now, and and actually recycling the business of recycling has has become less uh, profitable, I guess. Um, but uh, it, it's more expensive now, and since we know that the recycling center is is actually used by the community as well as the school, uh, we have a meeting set up with the city uh, this week to to talk about the recycling center and and figure out a plan to make sure that that uh, all the participants are able to use it and that uh, that everybody is is helping out with the cost of that. So uh, that's be that meeting is being held with the city tomorrow uh, to talk about when we can open the recycling center. Do you want to just say a word um, about the strategic plan? We do have Stacy McKiff, who was uh, your co chair uh, in this. We, we now actually have the plan that has been submitted from the strategic planning. Uh, committee and it is in really the cabinet's hands now. Do you want to describe what we need to do with that uh, moving forward so we have something to work from this fall? Yeah, so the the strategic planning task force submitted their their uh, their recommendations to the cabinet. Those included about five or six broad areas and and then there was a list of of tactics that the committee or the task force had also discussed probably about 130 
there were a lot of things that uh, that were brought up in those conversations, and so that's been turned over to the cabinet. Uh, we're drafting that that final report, the actual report that will come out, and cabinet members are looking at that and taking ownership of some of those categories and saying, you know, looking at the the list of tactics that were provided by the task force, and under that that goal of things like student success or infrastructure. Um, then looking at some of those specific uh, tactics that were talked about by the task force, and then that will be, those will be incorporated in the final report. So work is still being done on that that task force, and I think that that uh, everyone will see that as it, it as it rolls out at the beginning of fall semester. Thank you. And another comment here about uh, the Thanksgiving question is. Um, one says if we are not meeting face to face after Thanksgiving break, all of our dance concerts will have to be canceled, which is a, a major concern for at least the dance department. Uh, we train in order to perform in front of a live audience for uh, for for viewing. And I think that's uh, that's uh, you know also I think uh, this is also true with music ensembles and other courses uh, that require presentations and projects. Uh, Dr. Hood, do you want to maybe address uh, some of these? You know, th this is very complicated because, um, you know, when, when, when we have a, a heavy performance element like we do uh, here at Snow College, uh, virtual, uh, do it, going virtual uh, creates um, other stress. It does. And for dance and for music ensembles and for art shows that visual art people want to put together that are capstone experiences, other capstone experiences for courses, for some labs and so on, it creates great stress. And that's one of the reasons that why at this point we want to be able to continue with regular classes after Thanksgiving, if at all possible. However, we have to be nimble also. We can't project what's going to happen in terms of uh, the state and the country, in terms of where the COVID-19 is going to be come November and December. So we have to have alternatives to try to figure out how can we accommodate students as best we can. Um, the, a good plan to look at is what Vance Larson has put together in the music department. Vance has uh, scheduled out how uh, we will be able to have uh, concerts, how we'll be able to do different things. They're not ideal, uh, but what it does is it keeps the spirit of the presentation that students are prepared for. But I agree, the dance students work so hard and they want to be able to have an audience and it's this ultimate uh, showing of, of their skills and their talents and the things that they've learned and we want to be able to do that. So that's why we're trying to hang on to this idea that we want to come back after Thanksgiving. Uh, even if we do, however, and even if it's green, even if we're under green, green still comes with limitations on what we're able to do. We're in the middle of a pandemic. So that would mean that even we would still have to have special seating arrangements and other things, masks and so forth for audiences as well. So there's, uh, I, I encourage you to look at the COVID-19 regulations that we have on our website to see how that will, will come down. Terrific. And I want to bring uh, in some of the other um, cabinet members here. Um, uh, Josh, could we maybe um, turn uh, the time to you as to anything you may want to announce to the to the campus relative to, um, uh, you know, uh, work hours, uh, coverage, um, you know, those kind of things that people are wondering about that we have kind of a soft opening now. Uh, many of our, uh, many of our, our, our buildings are open, uh, but that doesn't mean that people are fully back uh, in the seat. We do want to, to have people work at home where and whenever possible, uh, but we also are in the service uh, business so we need to make sure that we're covering, um, you know, you know, providing coverage. So do you want to talk a little bit more about uh, about that? Yeah, so um, hopefully you guys have been seeing the emails uh, that, that say, uh, you know, reminding everybody that we we are open. We have been since Monday. Um, and uh, but that said, that doesn't necessarily mean that everybody's here all the time. Um, so, for example, uh, here in the HR office, you know, we're, we're um, on kind of a, a staggered schedule. So um, typically there's about half of us here uh, at any given time. The rest of us are working from home um, and, and we, we really encourage 
um, all offices to you know look at doing something similar where uh, you know our, our offices are, are staffed to the point that we can um, kind of take that walk-in traffic and, and serve them as they need uh, to be served but um, also you know not necessarily bringing everybody on campus at once because um, again we, we are uh, still uh, fighting this virus um, so some some people have also asked well you know we, we've been doing this uh, remote work um, it, it seems to have really work, worked out well for a lot of people um, and some people say well you know now that we've already got some experience and the technology to do it um, can we do some more uh, remote working in the future um, and I would say the the short answer is yes um, and uh, the, the long answer will uh, uh, be in an email that will come out for me later today um, so um, you know like like uh, President Cook said um, we are in a service industry so you know it's it's not like um, you know we're a, a silicon slopes company that can just send everybody home to, to code from home 24 7. we do need people here uh, to serve our students and community um, but that said we don't always have to have everybody here all the time um, and so uh, we're going to send some guidance uh, to everybody later today the, the, the same guidance has already went to uh, your managers last week um, so they could kind of work out the kinks and ask any questions um, but uh, further guidance will be coming uh, probably in the next hour or so. Terrific. Um, listen, let's uh, let's turn some time over to Terry Clausen, who she and her staff are are working tireless, tirelessly to um, uh, on our on our enrollment, um, both from new students um, as well as returning students. Do you want to give us a, a sense of where we are, Terry, at this point? Yeah. I would love to. So as we've said over the past few weeks as we've had these meetings that um, our new students were actually doing quite well. Um, although I'm going to put a big caveat here because we do not know what will happen. This year is kind of an outlier, so I can't look at any of our historical data and say this is what we are predicting will happen. But I mean right now we are sitting really solidly about 250 students ahead of where we were last year, which considering the fact that we are in a global pandemic and we have um, had, you know, declining enrollment over the past four or five years, I'm taking that as a win. Um, we're, we're doing pretty well there. So um, all of the admissions um, office has been working tirelessly to reach out to students and to push them through the funnel um, and I'm just I'm really happy with the work that they're doing because I think all of that is is finally paying off. The one area of enrollment that we are concerned about is our returning students and we're down um, just shy of 200 students um, in that continuing category and that worries me a bit just for the fact that um, anecdotally from our calling campaigns and other outreach, we've heard that students are just kind of hedging their bets. They, they did not have a great experience in pivoting towards that middle part of the semester after spring break to that online or remote learning that it just, they're, they're just uncertain. <laughs> so um, we are seeing that um, some students are finally feeling like, OK, I've been home enough. It, it's time to start registering for classes, but we're going to be hard pressed to meet those same continuing students as last year. Our hope is that we can make up that difference with the new freshmen so that we can see either a flat or slightly increased enrollment this fall across the board, um, but we have a lot of work to do there. So <laughs> we're going to keep working. Um, another thing that is really exciting is that we have been working with our consultant Ruffalo Noel Levitz um, on the scholarship piece. We signed um, last year. We had them do some analysis on our scholarshiping and um, to kind of help us take a look at that financial net tuition process and one thing that I, we've mentioned before is that how great it it is to increase our FAFSA filers because we are notoriously low in that area and um, they've been helping us do that. So 
we want to encourage everyone <laughs> as you talk to students, ask them that, that magic question, have you filled out the FAFSA? And if they haven't, please encourage them to do so. Right now we have some campaigns going out um, because we have a number of students. We've got about 600 students that have sent us a FAFSA that have been admitted to Snow College, but they have not registered. And so we're working very closely with those, especially that are full or partial Pell because we know that for many of them, it will cover complete tuition as well as housing and many living expenses. So we're encouraging them to um, to come to Snow and experience that value and knowing that they will pay very little out of pocket if necessary. And then we also have a campaign that is going on in Henderson, Nevada and Southern California. Those schools mentioned that they are all going online next year. And we have some name recognition in those markets with families that have connection to Snow College and the state of Utah. So we're hoping to capitalize on some of that where students have been excited for that college experience and knowing that you no, know, it's going to be online. We want to encourage them to come here. We have that Wooly tuition rate, so it's extremely affordable for this um, population of students. And why not? I mean, we have got these um, <laughs> practices in place to have a safe, a clean environment, uh, you know, and a really valuable and high impact educational experience. So we're hoping to see some fruits of our labors there to help us as well. Um, but we are just working nonstop. That is what we are doing right now. Well, another terrific initiative, uh, Terry, you can maybe describe this, is um, we are setting up with the next uh, two, two and a half weeks, a call center, uh, which will hire some of our more mature students to do really four things over the course of of the year or years uh, one is uh, again we talked mentioned it earlier that we'll be able to use these students to reach out to non-traditional students and connecting them to some of the short-term training programs that we'll be designing so that's number one and probably more immediate the second really is is uh, they can also be a function in which we can reach out to to returning students right that that because we're putting a lot of pressure on our advisors and a lot of pressure on existing staff uh, of these campaigns of communicating with either potential new, potentially new students or returning students and to be able to have a call center that can offload some of that pressure uh, that we can continue to, to keep to, to keep uh, the communication flowing is another one. It also will be a, a, a function which we can use for fundraising, right? So if we reach out to our alumni uh, association, um, uh, especially with our our um, the announcement of the need-based scholarship campaign that we're um, that we are have, have embarked. And by the way, we're doing terrific. We're the five million dollar goal that we had. We're about four and a half million uh, there now. So we're just kind of rounding out the uh, the tail end of that. But we need more and more financial assistance for need-based uh, aid. Um, uh, interesting enough, and that just this might interest the group. Uh, I talked to a homeless student yesterday. Uh, this student actually reached out to the city and uh, and that name got, got to me, but this student is planning on coming here uh, in the fall, but doesn't have money for housing and was asking for permission to camp um, on the city perimeter. And so I reached out to him and talked to him and, and he's been homeless for years, but is very committed to getting his education. And so I've talked to him about um, this, this this COVID relief money, right? That's that's available uh, about Pell grants. So students are in need, and it's surprising to me how important education is for them, even if they have to plan on camping <laughs> in the forest uh, to get an education. And we uh, we've got to be able to find ways in which we can help students. And so having these kind of call centers that can reach out. In, in multiple ways, I think will be a very good uh, return on investment of, of resources that uh, we dedicate there. But you want to talk a little bit about the call center and 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 how we probably will will use it for different uh, kind of different uh, for different purposes. Yeah, absolutely. So um, right now, the bulk of communication to either our potential students or our current students 
um, all is laid in the laps of our admissions advisors or our academic advisors, or sometimes we wrote people in that might have a little less to do because you know they're they're cyclical in their work and and we pull them in and then we ask them to make telephone calls for us and we tend to do that nor do we do that during normal business hours Let's see if i can spit that out today and <laughs> we miss the mark on our non-traditional students and our our potential students because they are not available nine to five necessarily and so utilizing a call center that has student employees we might be able to shift those hours so that we can be much more effective in our communications with them and you know hit them you know right after school all the way up until like nine o'clock at night where we have that um, prime time uh, interaction we do hope that by having this call center we can do even more outreach like we would love to be able to make more connections and more contacts with students and um, right now we're limited because we've got four admissions advisors <laughs> right now um, and that makes it really difficult to to contact when you know we have 5,000 applicants that have been admitted to the institution and we only have 1,200 that have actually registered for classes so just any of those extra touch points are going to be key. With the new initiatives, and just if anyone's wondering why we've talked about this here, it's very important for us with enrollment. I'm thrilled for these short term trainings because as Dr. Gilmore was saying, this is an opportunity for us to get in front of those individuals and really promote a Snow College education to them. So we're going to reap some of the benefits enrollment wise after the fact. So any help that we can do to get more and more students involved in that short term training is actually going to pay off in the back end by increasing our enrollment and giving us that opportunity to um, have a captive audience, so to speak, <laughs> for our message about how great Snow College is and how we can be a benefit to them in their lives. Terrific. Well, listen, we're rounding down to the 90 minute mark, and so we want to uh, we probably have a hard um, a hard close in um, in about five minutes. But I do want to remind you uh, that uh, continue to stay involved uh, and engage. Ask questions. Are there are there ways in which we can communicate better uh, with you? Um, are, are there topics that you want us to cover? Um, uh, guests that we can we can invite uh, to, to be on to um, um, so that we can keep you uh, informed. Um, the COVID pages continue to be updated. Um, so continue to sort of refer to that. We have a very hard working um, emergency operations committee that meets weekly on these sorts of questions and, and putting together all the logistics for a safe opening uh, in, uh, in, in the fall. Um, continue to sort of let us know what you think about the question about Thanksgiving. I think we're, we're everything's on the table uh, for this. Um, but um, thank you very much. Um, I don't know if there are any other comments or uh, questions from the panel here, but um, raise your hand if there are any sort of last final comments. We will again convene here in two more weeks. Uh, when we get to uh, when we get to the fall sem semester, we'll kind of go back to a weekly open forum like this if you continue to think this is a helpful way to stay connected. Uh, stay safe, everybody. Uh, we appreciate what you do. Uh, you make Snow College a special place, and I'm very, very proud to uh, to work with you. So until next time, um, have a have a terrific summer.